<laughs> Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have Philip Perea, the, uh, the uh, editor of Minute Dot and an investment advisor, Tyler Kuski, chair of the uh, El Dorado Libertarian Party, and uh, John Cameron, the author of Rewire Retail, selling when you can't see the white of their whites of their eyes, and uh, and the development officer of Pacific Legal Foundation. We're uh, doing our first uh, post. Uh, inauguration show, the post-Trump show, and I, I, I've divided the uh, cabinet appointments up into the good, the bad, and the ugly. Then and then this, then is all, this is all, you know, my, my judgment on good, bad, and ugly. You guys might disagree, but uh, let's start out with uh, my first example of good, which is the uh, nominee for the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA, Scott Pruitt, John, good, bad, or ugly? Uh, good. I almost feel like singing a song to Scott Pruitt. Something don't, like don't. Uh, please don't. Something <laughs> like um, Scotty Pruitt, you're our man. Um, That's okay. See That's if enough. you can see if you can bankrupt the Enviro's plan. I don't know something. I mean, uh, the guy fought him tooth and nail um, when he was Oklahoma Attorney General. Sued the EPA. Advocates uh, dismantling large parts of it, and. Um, um, I want to talk a little bit about how invasive the Environmental Protection Agency and its and its sister uh, bunch of thugs, uh, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers, can be. Um, I'm a development officer for Pacific Legal Foundation, and my opinions are not those of political or Pacific Legal Foundation. But the organization defends the Constitution, and um, you know, just gives you one tiny example of how how crazy. Um, that combination of the EPA and the Corps of Engineers in certain areas can be. In certain areas, Southern California, they understand that commerce has to exist so people have jobs and civilization and can go on. But in Northern California, they uh, um, went after a guy for plowing a field, which is um, in the Clean Water Act, which is an abomination. Waters of the United States rules are just crazy, and under the way the EPA reads them, 95% uh, of the surface of the United States is probably under their control. They Classified uh, as a wetland. Hmm? Classified as a wetland, yeah. yeah. And um, so hopefully that's going to get changed. But they they went after a guy for plowing field, which is exempt from their, their own regulation, which is an interpretation of the law. So they, they there's a law, which is kind of fuzzy, poorly written, and they created regulations, which are actually pretty clear-cut, but one horribly overreaching. And then they interpret those laws to expand the boundaries even further. And so even though the regulation says plowing is specifically exempt from the um, uh, Clean Water Act, they're going after this guy for millions of dollars. And um, just a farmer. Plowing a field has been plowed many times before. And so if... if uh, Scott Pruitt, I'm going to call him Scotty, like I know him. If uh, Scotty can rein them in and, and whack many parts of that organization, which is uh, like any government organization, what happens is, is zealots rise to the top. And because they are um, not elected, don't have to answer to anybody and aren't held accountable, they <coughs> make life hell for, for people who are just trying to make a living. Well, you mentioned uh, being uh, zealots. Uh, the uh, EPA, of course, has been under the uh, uh, sway of the Obama administration for the last eight years mm -hmm. and has, uh, as such, been able to recruit uh, a whole lot of uh, environmental holy warriors over, mm -hmm. the, over the last eight years, uh, which have uh, rewritten waters of the United States, redefined waters mm -hmm. of the United States to include pretty much any uh, square inch of land in the country. Uh, as a wetland, uh, mm -hmm. even though, of course, it's, it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, and the interesting background that Scott Pruitt brings to the position is he, as the Attorney General of uh, Oklahoma, has been suing uh, the EPA know, on, a number, on a number of different yeah. uh, fronts for uh, overreaching and overstepping their, their, both their legislative, their, their, their statutory authority, and their constitutional authority. So. Uh, he is obviously somebody that's being put in there to shake things up. But you're talking about an, an entrenched bureaucracy, a very entrenched bureaucracy, as all bureaucracies are, filled with what I call watermelon environmentalists, green on the outside, red on the inside. 
uh, using environmental laws to further other uh, social and uh, uh, political uh, ends. Mm. And they're not going to take kindly to the new boss. Mm. I think that's... Uh, no, they will question. not go quietly into the night, that's for sure. And the interesting thing that Trump has done is he has essentially put a muffler on the uh, agency. He has forbade them from uh, tweeting, from putting out press releases, from putting out new interpretations of the rules, from basically doing anything in public at all until uh, he has got, got Scott Pruitt confirmed in, uh, in, the, uh, in the seat and, and running things. Mm -hmm. So well, they're, they're, they're really going after Just a, just a comment EPA. on that. That is common practice, by the way, in the financial services industry, even <clears throat> though it's not a public uh, uh, agency, uh, uh, we are forbidden from making comments that have not been pre-approved. Uh, by the firm and ultimately the uh, regulatory organization FINRA and ultimately the SEC. But the other part of that is just when we were coming to air <clears throat> and things hitting uh, today is that uh, Trump essentially defunded the EPA. Uh, he gave a, he wrote an executive order today uh, stating that all grants and all projects uh -huh. which the EPA funds are halted. And once you take away the money, you take away, there's no reason for the job to exist. And once you take away the job, you have effectively, you know, eviscerated the agency, which, you know, that's what he said he was going to do. And by golly, he's doing it. Yeah. And of course, the people, the EPA has been funded, have been the environmental zealots and the activists and the on, the, uh, on the green side. And they are effectively now, uh, uh, well, apoplectic with anger, uh, as, as, as you would expect. And the, the, let's add something to that. One of the things that the Greens do is sue and settle. <laughs> and they, they sue uh, government agencies and settle. And in essence, what that is, is an end run around the grant process. Because these zealots in these, these alphabet agencies love their fellow commies in the, uh, who are in these non-government organizations, NGOs. And so... It's my firm belief that what they've been doing is, uh, you know, basically rolling over and giving them millions of dollars because they support what they're doing, and they're they're if a if a uh, an organization that that uh, favored commerce and development or something like plowing a field or harvesting timber or mining the earth sued them, they wouldn't settle. What they would do is spend every penny of the taxpayers' money they could get fighting them. But when the Greens sued them. Uh, instead of holding the Greens to their, their requirements, for example, the Endangered Species Act, they don't even require validation of their numbers or anything else. Just says, oh, yeah, we're bad. Here's some millions of dollars. And we're going to put this butterfly on the, on the list and 10,000 square miles. Yeah, that's a different agency, is, but yeah, uh, same, yeah, same principle. So, yeah, same principle. And, yeah, and I, I did twist agencies there. But, so this has been not only the grants, but um, the the... You know the fact that uh, they've been basically paying the bills for these people from from court awards as well, and they get attorneys' fees and all these other things because uh, the the courts look on them kindly because they are part of the government as well. So I think uh, if I could sum it up, I think Scott Pruitt is is I would think of this list has got to be at the top or very very near the top of of the good. He was the first person I put on my list. Mm -hmm. Second person I put on my list was uh, uh, Betsy DeVos, who has uh, been nominated to head the Department of Education. Now, of course, we think that the Department of Education is like a, uh, a, a cancer on the body of the educational uh, system. Mm -hmm. They don't do anything other than suck life and money from education. Mm -hmm. They don't teach a person. They're totally unnecessary. Mm -hmm. But they exist, and you have to have somebody uh, and, until the department is dismantled, which is not uh, on the horizon, you have to have somebody uh, running the department. Betsy DeVos is a real interesting person. Uh, tell us about her, Tyler. She is actually uh, pro probably better at she was actually more of a teacher, and that's a lot of criticism. But the fact that she's an entrepreneur is actually what's gonna, probably going to you know, help, help out with uh, you know, pushing you know, a better education system, allowing that checks and balances, allowing a more capitalist approach towards uh, the education system. But one thing I do I did notice about her is that her brother actually, uh, Eric Prince, founder of Blackwater, uh, is someone who identifies as a libertarian. 
Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. Uh, so not change su subjects too much, but Eric Prince uh, donated to the Libertarian Party. It is donated to the Republican Party as well, and surprisingly to the Green Party <coughs> of Pennsylvania. Uh, a few years ago, I do remember reading an article where he proposed a plan <clears throat> actually that reduced uh, military spending and to the Department of Defense, and believe it or not, they turned it down, of course, because they want to spend tons of money. But it was actually a very libertarian approach towards <coughs> war. It was, it was reducing the amount of complication, reducing the amount of spending. And one thing I, I always thought was surprising is that, because he is openly Catholic, and I always assumed that he might be very anti-Muslim or something like that, but it's actually donated towards uh, building uh, mosque and everything towards the Muslim community as well, and is building relationships and has a very political tactic when fighting wars rather than a very militaristic tactic. And that's really the difference between how he runs or wants to run fight fight a war versus how the government is trying to fight a war. Well, Betsy DeVos is, is uh, an heir or uh, heiress. heiress to yeah. the uh, Amway fortune. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, you know, and has been active in uh, public uh, in in uh, charter schools and mm -hmm. uh, uh, private school education alternatives, mm -hmm. private education alternatives to public schools uh, in Michigan and across the country for for, for decades now. Mm -hmm. She is an activist toward uh, toward homeschooling, toward uh, charter schools, toward all kinds of different uh, private school mm -hmm. initiatives. Basically, arguing the case that public schools will only improve if they have some competition rather than uh, be in, in the monopoly position that they are in in most districts and in most areas of the country. What? So she is, a, she is somebody who is going to, from a, the highest uh, education position in the country, uh, argue in favor of more choice, more competition, mm -hmm. uh, more excellence in education. And I think that's why the education lobbies, the, the NEA, the teachers unions, are adamantly opposed to her. Well, the, the, she's come out in favor of charter schools, but even even better is the voucher system. Yeah. And um, the, the nice thing, I, her, her intellectual approach, I don't know whether she identifies as libertarian or what, but um, there's, a, there's a kind of a Calvinist approach to, you know, the idea that, uh, uh, you know, that work is good and work should be rewarded and she actually follows a kind of a new Calvinist uh, theologian, and um, you know the idea that, that things should be earned and not given, and that people should be held to standards and and uh, sacrifice to achieve goals is good, and all those things that kind of went into making that fortune. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and and I think it's a wonderful approach, and. Uh, you know, the idea that, that you brought up, and I don't completely disagree with it, that, that she doesn't have a teaching background, but the problem with having a teaching background is very few former teachers that can get out of the echo chamber. You know, they start drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, is it, uh, Michelle, was it Ree? She started out as a teacher, I believe. And she did a wonderful job of getting out of the echo chamber, but it's really hard when all you hear around you is that... Uh, you know, that we have to keep the teachers union strong and keep, uh, you know, outside voices away so we can teach the students. But the, the entrepreneurial approach is, is all about accountability. And there is, no matter what these teachers unions and everything say, no accountability for teachers for actually producing a student who can think critically and do math and read and all the other things that are necessary for this very competitive environment. And, and I think she's going to be a really good, really good influence I think on she, education. she'll also have a very strong influence on fighting racial differences within schools, where you have, system, where you have schools that have a, perhaps a larger group of uh, whites or in other schools that have a lot more minorities. And the problem with that is that when people live in uh, certain areas, they don't have necessarily have a choice to go to a certain school. And so the issue, and what, what the liberals are always complaining about this, they're always saying, well, we, we have these schools that are, where you have very low income people that are always going to the same schools, and yet you have people who are very high income and they're always all in the same schools as well, you don't have that integration. Well, the reason is because of zoning. You have a very government structured towards allowing people to go to school. You don't get to choose which school you go to. Whereas if you have the voucher system, 
parents will be allowed to send their students or sort send their kids to the school of their choice. And you can actually integrate and you can have mixed cultures, mixed races, mixed wealth, wealth versus uh, poverty. And you can have all that mixture and have a very mixed environment. So that's another thing that should also be noted as well, that she, we will fight a, fight a lot of the uh, racial differences. Which brings up the question, as we speak, she has not been confirmed, is the, and she's probably one of the uh, most ardently fought uh, nominations by, uh, the, by the Democratic uh, mm -hmm. minority. Will they be able to bring enough uh, Republicans uh, across the uh, Maginot line, so to speak, to uh, prevent her from being con uh, confirmed, do you think? I, I hope not. The, the, my fear is that the, the, um, the teacher's lobby, um, the government school lobby, is such a, an enormous force. They've, uh, they take um, a good chunk of money every month out of anybody that belongs to the union, and they spend it politically, even though they say they don't, to reinforce their monopoly on, on government money for education. So it's going to be a tough fight because they have probably literally billions of dollars to spend in this fight. And, and a lot of politicians on both sides of the aisles are beholden to them. So it's going to be a tough fight. But I hope, I, I hope, I would say I'd pray, but that would be kind of hypocritical. Um, I'm, I'm, um, I'm hoping she makes it because she's a great choice. So we've, we've covered a couple of the good ones. There's a couple more good ones, but let's get into some of the bad, the absolutely bad choices, cabinet choices that Trump has made. Uh, first on my list of bad is the uh, trade and industry policy advisor, Peter Navarro, author of Death by China, a person who is going to be a trade war proponent, mm -hmm. a disaster when it comes to uh, uh, global commerce and international commerce. I, I would agree that, that, that he's a bad choice. And isn't this trade and policy advisor a newly created the council isn't that a newly created position? It's not the, a cabinet The council position. is newly yeah, created. Yeah, it's not he a cabinet it. position. I don't yeah. believe it's an appointed position. Uh, so he doesn't have to get confirmed, which is absolutely, uh, actually a, a sad thing because mm -hmm. that's one person who, if he had to get confirmed, shouldn't be. Well, the guy. other part of it is that he's, uh, I, I think he's a Democrat. Um, and um, he's, uh, he's a professor, he's at, Irvine. A professor at UC Irvine. Irvine and. Um, mm -hmm. And is he a Harvard grad? I'm not, I think he's a Harvard grad. So um, I have a problem with some of the elite schools, and I think they turn out, and I'm not saying all people that come out of these elite schools are this way, but in essence, what I would consider sociopaths. Um, the the uh, ends justifies the means. In this case, I don't understand what the ends can be. Um, you know, and, and I understand uh, being worried about China um, being upset about China and some of the things they, they do to uh, in, in, um, in the international arena to promote um, their own economy to the detriment of other people. You know, I understand that. I'm not saying that um, the solution is what he proposes. I would say the solution would be uh, instead of um, worrying about what some somebody else is doing is make make our country more competitive by, you know, slashing our our horrible, stifling regulatory environment by cutting the highest corporate tax rate in the world so all corporations in America don't have to work fever feverishly with probably five percent of their uh, their income to try to manipulate this tax scheme that we have rather than pointing a finger at at China and saying, you know, you're bad, we're not going to trade with you. Because it, that's just, the world doesn't work that way anymore. And anybody thinking that they can um, win a trade war is um, insane. And I'll say, sorry, one last thing, that I believe a lot of these choices, Trump is a deal maker. And, and whenever you negotiate, and he's, you know, famous for uh, negotiating, or at least talking about being a great negotiator. One of the things you want to do is negotiate from a position of perceived strength. And having uh, somebody that I would consider an intellectual lunatic on trade, this guy, in this position, might actually benefit in trade negotiations. Um, because the, the tendency would be to think that you know, this guy's going to throw tariffs up against it. He's going to do everything else. And so when you go to the table, you might want to mollify a little bit. But 
you know, in the in libertarian world, there wouldn't be any tariffs. You wouldn't need trade negotiations. Let commerce provide good products and services. So I think he's a really, 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 really bad choice. This can also trickle down to smaller businesses as well. Uh, I, outside of uh, politics, I, I, I'm a technology consultant, and I work with co small companies to develop software, such as apps and websites. And in the future, uh, this is not necessarily directly in that issue, but in the future, this, this can become problematic because what is, ends up happening is when you need software developed, you have countries like India that are very good at developing software. You can get hire an engineer for about 2 or $3 an hour. And they have two master's degrees, and two dollars, three dollars an hour over in India is very high end. That's that's a livable wage. That's that's something that that puts food on the table. We're here in America getting the same type of skill set is about fifty dollars an hour. So you have a huge difference. So you're talking about companies that have a startup idea. They want to get something, some software developed, and if they have to do it here in America, they're not going to be able to finance it. There's not enough. There's no capital. That if they're very small, they have to have some form of angel investor in order to get it done. Whereas dealing business outside of the country, doing business with, with India and China and other countries where you can hire someone at a, at a lower, lower wage allows small businesses to have good startup ideas and flourish and actually creates more wealth here than just over Yeah, and of course, that's, that's, the, uh, the, that's the underlying reason for the success of the Trump nativist appeal. I mean, he started out with a, a very strongly nativist appeal, build a wall to keep the Mexicans out, uh, prevent uh, people from Islamic countries from, from uh, immigrating, uh, basically uh, put up a, a 35, 45, whatever percent uh, tariff wall against China and against Mexico, accusing Chinese of uh, manipulating their currency. Well, the fact is, when it comes to China, they are manipulating the currency. They're keeping the, the yuan artificially high. Uh, they have something like four, or they used to have four trillion dollars in uh, reserves, mostly U.S. Treasuries. Mm -hmm. They are spending down those uh, U.S. Treasury reserves in order to support the higher price of the yuan, uh, in order to curry favor, uh, diplomatic favor, with the United States. If Trump does, in fact, take the advice of <coughs> Peter Navarro and others, who are uh, who are trade hawks or trade. Uh, protectionist talks, he will force China into a position where they say, to hell with defending the yuan. We'll be, if we continue to defend the yuan as, as, as strongly as we have been, we will uh, run out a foreign exchange by the end of 2017. And I'm not exaggerating on that. By the end of this year, they will, they will no longer be able to defend the yuan. They'll say, to heck with that. Let's have a major devaluation of the yuan and do it right now. Uh, and if they do that, that would be the signal for Trump to get involved in a, a full-fledged trade war. We're already positioning uh, aircraft carriers and, and armed forces uh, in the uh, islands uh, on the, uh, around the uh, South China Sea, the East China Sea, uh, islands that uh, China and the Philippines and Vietnam and other uh, countries uh, have disputed claims to. But the, but, but the Chinese have been developing. They've been uh, basically uh, paving uh, atolls and building landing strips. And creating building, atolls, yeah, creating yeah, artificial yeah, islands. Yeah, yeah. Building, building, uh, building islands mm -hmm. where it was just a shallow ocean before. So, you know, this is the kind of a situation that could easily lead into a shooting war if we're not careful. And I'm not sure about Trump, whether he's uh, playing, whether he's bluffing on all this, or whether he's uh, you know, stupid about this, or whether he's sly as a fox. Mm. We, time will and tell. Time will tell. I, I suspect that he is uh, way more intelligent than he sounds. And he certainly, anybody is way more intelligent than the pictures of Trump that the lamestream media chooses to uh, portray. I mean, if you, if you pull, if you go to, to Google or any of the major newspapers or or the Clinton News Network, or <coughs> Yahoo, or any of those things, and look at pictures of Trump. Every single picture is is him doing this. So uh, it's, two more two uh, more people uh, on the on the bad list include Attorney General Jeff Sessions. Mm -hmm. He's an immigration and a uh, drug warrior uh, hawk. Uh, he hasn't found a drug law that he wouldn't uh, throw everybody in jail for. Uh, and uh, Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin. Stephen Mnuchin is a, a Goldman Sachs crony, a capitalist from the word go. If you're talking about draining the swamp, 
what you're talking about is bringing in a swamp creature to rule the swamp. Mm. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, anybody, Philip, or anybody else? Well, uh, where Mnuchin is concerned, uh, uh, he seems intent on the idea that any uh, tax, any general tax proposal around income and the corporate tax rate, uh, and particularly a, a little-known provision called carried interest, which is the loophole that all investment capital swims through. Uh, he has said publicly that whatever plan is put in place regarding income tax rates will, be, uh, will not be a tax cut for the wealthy who particularly earn their uh, money, we can't call it income, uh, through carried interest. So what he's saying is that, look, we, we know how this deal works, and coming from Goldman, I suspect he does know how it works. Uh, and he has said so far that any, any change in the tax rates will not be a tax break for the wealthy. So, you know, that's where we are with that at the moment. Um, so maybe not so bad after all, is that what well, you're saying? Well, that, that is what he's saying. Okay, uh, well, we'll see. Yeah. We have a couple minutes left. Let's talk about the ugly. And the ugly uh, is uh, the uh, swamp creature himself, uh, Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus, uh, former uh, chairman of the Republican Party. Uh, a guy who has uh, been swimming in the swamp for decades, and I don't see how he can possibly be uh, somebody who would help drain the swamp. And the second person, who just absolutely amazes me, is the uh, uh, head of the VA, a guy by the name of David Shulkin, who is currently the undersecretary for VA, for health at the VA. Now, we're talking about a VA that's uh, failed on, on multiple counts for many years, and you're going to promote somebody from within? What's that all about? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a vet, and I can, I can tell you that I've, uh, thank goodness, when I was self-employed, uh, even when my business was up, considerably upside down, as many startups are for years, I always managed to uh, pay for uh, health insurance before the blessings of Obamacare, and uh, never had to go to a VA clinic, and I'm, um, I'm glad I didn't. Um, it's, you know, a horrible example of, I'm not saying all the wars that, that we've gone to are right, and that uh, we should have all the, the beat up old veterans that we have, but they're there. And so we've established one of the most inefficient uh, delivery organizations, not just um, inefficient. They take inefficiency to a level that uh, um, I've never seen anywhere. And so the only thing that I can think of is that, that perhaps he is uh, in any bad organization, there are good people. Well, and we'll see. Perhaps he's one of those good people. And that's, that's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, a, a small snapshot of what's going on with the Trump administration.